I think it would be a good idea this week to slow down. Okay, we've been kind of rushing through chapters one through four and a little bit of five. Um, I think, so we'll, we'll change what we do from the syllabus. And I think that's a good thing here with this content. It's tough content. Um, I'd like to continue talking about the same content of last week, essentially in more depth um, and use Mathematica for simulation this time instead of spreadsheet. And hopefully next week, as we get more into statistics and statistical tests, we can also get into R a little bit with some real basic things. I also want to emphasize that, you know, this is an applied stats course, so we probably should do some applications. And so this week I would like to do some applications, hopefully starting today, talking a little bit about insurance applications that would be most relevant for actuaries. But uh, even if you don't want to be an actuary, I hope it's still of interest to you in the sense that, hey, yeah, that's an area that we could apply probability and ultimately statistics to. Okay, so I think what might, might be good is to actually go over some homework problems to start with, to reemphasize the, the concepts that you turned in today, uh, especially the ones related to the log normal distribution, perhaps. And I realized in looking over the assignment uh, this morning that I has, had assigned for today, that I probably shouldn't have assigned 77 since you had already done 45 and it really wasn't that much different. So sorry about that. I re wasn't realizing it wasn't gonna be that much different. Um, the, the textbook did have a, pur a different purpose in assigning it sort of twice in that, in 45, you are essentially using what I've called the CDF method, whereas in 70, well, like 77, uh, they were wanting you to use the transformation formula involving derivative, but in my directions, I said, don't use the transformation formula, I said, use the CDF method. So you kind of end up doing the CDF method twice. Um, and by the way, on the assignment that, you, that I just turned back to you that I graded, uh, some of you went ahead and used the transformation method anyway with the derivative, which I gave you full credit for if you got it right. But since I told you to use the CDF method, if you use the CDF method and got and got did it right, essentially, I gave you a bonus point on that problem. So let's look at 45. So this is about a something called a log normal distribution. The name is a little confusing. It's not the log of a normal distribution. It's a distribution whose log is a normal distribution. Say that again. Log normal, it's a little confusing the name. It's not the log of a normal random variable, a normal distribution. Instead, it's a random variable, a distribution whose log is a normal random variable. They say X is a normal random variable and Y is E to the X. So why is the exponential of a, random, a normal random variable really? And therefore X would, which is normal, would be the log of Y, ln of Y. It would be the log of one of these log normals. The logarithm of Y is X is going to be normal. It's a little confusing. X is normal with mean mu and variance sigma squared. What are you trying to do in this problem? You're ultimately trying to derive the formula for the density, the PDF, that thing right there. And in 46, we we're gonna use it. So let's work on both of these problems. And essentially what the book is outlining for you is the CDF method, cumulative distribution function method. Find capital G, the CDF of the capital Y first, and then differentiate it to find the PDF, the density. Let's go through that, those details again. So X is normal with mean mu and variance sigma squared. Once again, I emphasize our textbook puts the variance there, but some textbooks put the standard deviation there in that second spot. I mean, if you're doing it in the abstract, if you write it as sigma squared, it's understood to be the variance. And if you just wrote it as sigma, then it would be understood to be the standard deviation. Y is e to the x. Think about this intuitively. 
pretend it's a standard normal up here. Pretend mu is zero and sigma squared is one. X would take on values centered at zero. And typically between negative three and three in such a situation. You transform those values, if you imagine those to be data values, by this formula e to the x, you're going to be taking numbers typically between negative three and three, typically close to zero, and exponentiating. What kind of numbers are you going to get out? You could think about the graph of e to the x. And maybe go ahead and label the, the axes with capital random variable letters, but uh, That's a little strange, but uh, maybe not a big deal. If most of your data values are close to zero and between negative three and positive three, in fact, 99.7% of them, the outputs, the values of Y are gonna range in here. They're gonna be positive for one thing, right? Because the output of E to the X is positive. E to the zero is one, so they'll be clustered pretty close to one mostly. Since most of these data values are close to zero, most of the outputs would be close to one. But there would be a long right tail, E cubed. What would that be? Around 20 maybe? The scale is off. E cubed would be around 20 or something. I suppose I should do it. E cubed. Yeah, I guessed right, is around 20. E to the negative three, about 0 0.05. You could say about 99.7% of the data values but will between, be between 0 0.05 and 20. Most of them will be clustered close to one. But every once in a while, you'll get a high outlier. And so the distribution of y will be right skewed, positive and right skewed. It, the, the, C, uh, the PDF of y probably looks something like this. Long right tail, PDF of y, a little f sub capital y of y, probably looks like that. Will its peak be at one? I would guess so. I'm not positive, we wanna check that out. Because it's right skewed, the mean would be bigger than one actually, because of the right skew, because of every once in a while having very high outliers. I'm trying to emphasize some statistical thinking here. Data values, simulated data values, or actual data values, sometimes you're going to get pretty high values, high outliers, skewing the mean to be bigger than one. The mean should be bigger than one. Probably the mode is at one, but let's just see what happens. So capital G of little y is, you could also call it capital F sub capital Y of little y. That's the CDF of capital Y. By definition, remember this is the CDF method right here. That's the probability that capital Y is less than or equal to little y. It's always what the CDF is, whether the variable, random variables, discrete or continuous or mixed. Haven't done a mixed yet. We will actually, if we have time to do, do a mix today insurance application. What do you do? Well, you try to relate this to X. Replace Y with E to the X. You're trying to relate it to the CDF of X. I better try to isolate X on the one side of the inequality. Take the log inside the inequality. And the inequality does stay the same direction when you do so because the logarithm is an increasing function. That is the CDF of X evaluated at the natural log of Y, which our book you know, doesn't bother with the subscript there in this problem. They just call it capital F. And that, that does part A. Show G of Y equals F of LN of Y. Part B, differentiate it. Find the PDF. Just got to use the chain rule. Capital G prime of Y equals 
the derivative of this function, natural log of y is the inside function. I'm going to go ahead and keep using the subscript. Capital F sub x prime of the inside function times the derivative of the inside function. The derivative of natural log of y is one over y. That does part b right there, just the chain rule. You could also write this as little f sub capital X of natural log of y times one over y. And in fact, that helps you finish part C then, right? This is what you could call little g of y, or if you prefer, little f sub capital Y of y. I'm being inconsistent in my notation here, partially because I'm trying to use the book's notation. At the same time, I'm trying to use my notation. What do we need to finish part C? We just need the formula for the PDF of X. But X is normal. We can look up the PDF in the table. I got it marked with a sticky, but I still end up paging around to it. Right? Normal random variable, there's its PDF. Mean uh, mu standard deviation sigma. Just replace X with ln of Y and don't forget to divide by Y. And you get the formula in the problem. Can you do so? This becomes one over square root of two pi times sigma times Y. I'm dividing by Y there. I'm trying to match the formula in the book here on the problem. Yep, okay. Times EXP, which really means E to the, whatever's inside the parentheses. I get a one half and then it's, X gets replaced by natural log of Y, subtract mu, divide by sigma and square this thing. And that is the formula in the book when you square the fraction by squaring the top and the bottom. We essentially have a match. So that's the density of a log normal distribution with parameters mu and sigma, or mu and sigma squared if you prefer. However, mu and sigma squared are not the mean and the variance of y. So it's a bit confusing. They're the mean and the variance of X. They are parameters for this distribution. You see mu and sigma in the formula, but they're not the mean and the variance or the mean and the standard deviation for Y. So what would the mean and the standard deviation be? Hmm. I guess we'd have to figure those out. Let's now try to use Mathematica to figure those out. And we do want to do number 46 as well, for completion's sake. OK, so we're going to have you use Mathematica some this week. Here initially in this problem, all I'm trying to do is just get the formula for the PDF in there. I could do it this way. I could. On the palette here, which you can get to from the palette's menu, I got a writing assistant here. There is a button for a subscript right here. I'm going to do it like this. I'm going to write a little g sub mu underscore comma sigma underscore of y in square brackets colon equals. I'm defining this function. It's a function of y. It's the g in the book. But it's got two parameters, mu and sigma. So I'm, I'm putting those as subscripts to give me flexibility to change those. And we'll just type in the formula in the book here, one over square root of two pi times sigma. You can make a sigma by doing escape s escape and a mu by doing escape m escape. They're also in this type setting in here somewhere. 
You actually can do e to the, I mean, usually we do it as capital E to something. You actually can do exp as well with square brackets representing e to whatever's in the parentheses. Negative one half times ln in Mathematica, I hope you remember, is actually log. That should do it. Enter that. What it would be interesting, one thing that would be interesting is just uh, plotting this thing as mu and sigma vary. I could do that with manipulate. Right? Manipulate allows you to make animations. Plot g sub mu comma sigma, I don't use the underscores anymore, of y. y takes on positive values here. Remember in the book, they got y positive there because y is e to the x and e to the x can't be negative, can't, can't even be zero. <clears throat> oh, maybe I should go up to 20 here to allow myself to capture some high outliers when x is close to three. Start mu at zero, let it go down to negative three and up to positive three. Mm. Negative five to five. Start sigma at one, let it go down as low as 0 0.1 and as high as 10 maybe. That's the syntax for letting those things happen. There's what the PDF of y looks like when mu is zero and sigma is one. And yeah, it's got a peak close to one. Is, is it exactly one? Well, I'd have to use calculus, right? Try to maximize this function. G sub mu comma sigma prime of y. Yikes. <laughs> Maybe I should try mu is zero and uh, sigma is one. Simplify. Okay, that's getting better. When does that equal zero? It would equal zero when this equals zero, which is not gonna occur at y equals one. I guess I was, my guess was wrong. The mode is not at one. Uh, it would occur when log of y, ln of y equals negative one. Y equals e to the negative one is where the peak is. One over e, which is about 0.37. That's the modal value. The, in other words, the values cluster close to one over e, which yeah, I was not expecting that. Okay, so that was a surprising thing to me. The mean should be bigger than one though, I think. We could try to find the mean just by integration. Click an integral button, go from zero to infinity, y times g, g sub zero one of y should get something bigger than one, I'm guessing. Square root of e, yeah, that's bigger than one, about 1.65. Right tailed distribution here. Can we find the mean in general for a general mu and a general sigma? I don't know if it's, if it can, it's gonna do this or not. It will require me to make assumptions about mu and sigma. Let's just see what happens. Yeah. Probably, you see, Mathematica is sometimes too fancy for its own good. It's probably assuming mu and sigma could be complex numbers and it starts having trouble, yeah. Okay, they're saying this is what the answer is if the real part of sigma squared is positive. So it's imagining those things are complex numbers. Uh, but it does give an answer, is it correct? I think so, and it actually does simplify to just the numerator because this bottom essentially simplifies to one. 
right? Sigma, you could think of it as being the square root of sigma squared and would cancel with that other one. So it's essentially just this for the mean. And when mu is zero and sigma is one, that's e to the e to the one half, which is square root of e. About 1.65. Actually, Mathematica probably has a log normal distribution built in. If I go up to the help menu and go to documentation center, I bet I can look up log normal distribution. Log normal distribution is what I'm typing if you can't quite see it. Yeah, it has one. How about that? <clears throat> And in fact, if you did this kind of syntax with PDF in there, PDF, log normal distribution, mu and sigma, I bet we get the exact same formula that we just derived, except with an x instead of a y. There we go. That's the exact same formula that we just derived. So it's built in. Good to see. How about doing number 46? Applying the log normal distribution. What is the log normal distribution good for? Uh, evidently, it's good for situations like this, perhaps. <clears throat> Why is the diameter in millimeters of styrofoam pellets used in packing? Assume Y has a log normal distribution with those parameters. That doesn't mean the mean diameter is 0.8 and the standard deviation diameter is 0.1. These are not necessarily the mean and standard deviation of y. In fact, they're not. They're the parameters for y in terms of some normal distribution where the logarithm is of y is a normal distribution. Right? Log normal means the log of this distribution is normal. That's what I said. Find the probability that a randomly selected pellet has a diameter exceeds 2.7 millimeters. So the goal here is to use this formula from 45 in Mathematica to find that probability, to have Mathematica do an integral for you. This is the PDF, this is the density. Integrating it gives probabilities. So you just got to plug in mu equals 0.8 and sigma is 0.1 into there with my G notation. And we're trying to find the probability that the diameter exceeds 2.7 millimeters. So we go 2.7 to infinity of Y times G sub 0.8 comma 0.1. Now I'm sure you didn't, you know, when you did this problem, you just hopefully type the formula in from the textbook instead of defining a function g like I've done. So this should be the answer. It's trying to do it symbolically so you get an imaginary part, but that's effectively zero. It is meant to be zero. There's numerical error. Once again, Mathematica is being a bit too fancy for its own good. So the answer should be 0 0.075. Is that what you got? I thought I got something different when I tried this earlier. We want to find the probability that a randomly selected pellet ha has a diameter that exceeds 2.7. So this seems right. Exceeding 2.7, 2.7 or higher. I was thinking I got 0 0.02 or something when I did it before. Maybe I did it wrong before. <clears throat> um. Does this correspond to a certain probability for the log of y, a certain a certain normal distribution? Would I would I integrate a normal distribution from two point seven to infinity and get the same answer? We can do this.
That's a normal. That's the PDF of a normal distribution with a mean of 0.8 and a standard deviation of 0.1. Does this give the same answer? No, it doesn't. In fact, again, ignore the I part. There's the real part. That's the the answer. It's microscopic. It's not the same. Hmm. But could I? There's got to be some corresponding calculation I could do to get the same answer, wouldn't there be? Anybody got a guess of instead of instead of two point seven here, what something different I should put there? You're on the right track. Yeah, natural log of 2.7, I think, should give us the right answer. Remember, LOG is natural log in Mathematica. Okay, that's giving, giving me the answer I got before. So, okay, what did I do wrong? Did it maybe my formula for G? That's correct. And I am treating sigma like the standard deviation here instead of the variance. And mu is 0.8 and sigma is 0.1 are given as the standard dv, the mean and standard deviation of the situation, uh, the, which is not the mean and standard deviation of y. Um, hmm. Oh, I, that's, I was about to say, I think I know what was wrong, but now I'm not so sure. Oh, yes, I do know what's wrong. Why am I multiplying by Y? I was imagining I was doing a mean. That's better. There we go. And that matches. Yeah, the mean of Y in this situation, although I'd have to start at zero, you'd want to multiply by y. The mean, 2.2367, but that's not the same either, was it? Does that, oh, okay. I was thinking the more abstract situation. Does that match that when u is 0.8 and sigma one. Yeah. Um. No. You put eight. Okay. Thank you. There we go. Okay. That matches. This is the mean in general for a log normal distribution with parameters mu and sigma. And that's going to get pretty big pretty fast as either mu or sigma increase. Coming back to the picture of the PDF, how does changing mu and sigma affect things? The density definitely moves to the right as mu and sigma increase pretty rapidly, especially as sigma rapid. Um, hmm. Thinking did that. Wild. Oh, kind of unexpected things going on here. As sigma increases, the mean should increase as well. So that's a bit confusing. Seems like the mean is decreasing. Hmm. I'm not sure what's going on there. So more mystery that I'll have to investigate because I'm not quite sure what's going on. As far as part B goes, you have to do probably do a little experimentation or well, you know the 6899 99.7 rule for normals. About 95% are going to be within two standard deviations of the mean. For the corresponding normal random variable, the ln of y is a normal with mean 0.8 and standard deviation 0.1. And about 95% will be between 0.6 and, and 1.0, right? Within two standard deviations of the mean. 
So to find the corresponding values of y, just exponentiate those. The answer should be for part b should be e to the point between e to the point six and e to the first. And e to the first is of course e. So should have gotten about 1.82 and 2.72 for part B. Let's confirm it by integrating. So if I go from 1.82 here to 2.72, Should be close to 0.95. Yeah. So he's using the 68.95.99.7 rule that for a normal distribution, about 95% of the values are within two standard deviations of the mean. For not y itself, but the natural log of y, which will be normal with that mean and that standard deviation, to say for that variable, about 95% will be within between 0.6 and 1 within two, stand, two standard deviations of the mean. And then exponentiating those is going to get the corresponding values for y. y equals e to the x, right? Exponentiate. So I imagine that, that was that probably felt difficult for most of you to figure out exactly what was going on there. But I hope this exploration cleared it up some. Can we do simulations in math? Like, yes, you can. The key, we are, I, I showed you a notebook where I had a random choice in there, but really in, the, in general, the key command is random variate. Random variate. Very flexible command for doing lots of probability simulations in Mathematica. This will do a random variable, uh, a simulated random, random value from a normal distribution, a standard normal, in fact, when you don't have anything inside there, the assumption of a standard normal. So you enter this over and over again, about 95% of the time, for example, you're going to get between negative two and two within two standard deviations of the mean. In fact, maybe we should do comma 100 here. Now we're about 68% of those between negative two and two. We could, uh, however we do this, count. I forget how count works. You know what? I forget how things work in Mathematica myself, so I always just have to look things up and mimic other examples. Count can count the number of things in a list with a pattern mm, that looks confusing. Those examples look confusing. Uh, I know I've used it before. Maybe count if. No, okay. I know I've used count before in this kind of way, unless it was a slightly different command. So I'm a little confused about these examples. I could count how many things are between negative two and two in this list. And it should be uh, about 95% of them, right? Did I say 68% before? About 68% would be between negative one and one, right? About 95% would be between negative two and two. We should only see about five that are not between negative two and two. That's probably a better way to look at it. See any twos or negative twos? Uh, there's one. There's another one. Right there. There's a third. Probably we might find one or two or three more. I'm not seeing any more at the moment. Confirming the 95% or so that are between negative two and two, and so about 5% or slightly, slightly less between either bigger than two or less than negative two. Um, 
if we mimic this, evidently we can simulate from a log normal. Maybe I should, maybe I should do this. Maybe I should, uh, let's go X data. Random variate, normal distribution, thinking about problems 45 and 46 with mean 0.8 and standard deviation 0.1. Let's do a hundred simulated values there. From a normal distribution with a mean of 0.8 and a standard deviation of 0.1. So these numbers are all close to 0.8. Could I transform these values, Y data, using the exponential function, E to the X, to get a log normal situation? Yeah, you can. Wow. I think I can just do this. X, X data. I think I can do that. These are now log, this is now log normal data. I'm applying the exponential function to all those numbers that were in X data. The mean of the numbers in X data, and, I, and you can use mean, mean of X data, that should be close to 0.8. Mean of Y data should be close to E to the 0.8. Close to 2.2, a little less. Yeah, a little less than this. Is it matching? Is the data matching the graph of the PDF for this log normal distribution with parameters 0 0.8 and 0 0.1? Very skinny and tall. Uh, clustered close to E to the 0.8, which is 2.2. So maybe I should just go from one to three here or so. I'll start at zero. If I made a histogram statistics of the Y data, would it match this? It should. I don't know if it would make sense to plot them on the same scale or not, same axes here. I'm not sure if this is going to work. Okay, it sort of works. I think I'd like more bars in the histogram at least. Histogram. How do you make more bars? Options. Oh, uh, it's not so clear here. Um, chart. Maybe I just need to look for more examples or something. I'm looking for this. Trying to add more bars to the histogram. You think it'd be easier to find an example of this? None of those look like they would help. Okay, I'm not going to worry about it then. Okay, reasonable. Let these match. Actually, the the PDF for this log normal for this example doesn't look too much different from a normal does it it's pretty symmetric this curve down here you could probably approximate it with the normal but the mean would be close to 2.2 instead of 0.8 
And yeah, you could use random variate also to simulate from a log normal distribution. And this is going to produce different simulated data. But if I made a histogram of the Y data and the new Y data, they're probably not too different looking. Just want to put two histograms side by side here. Same general pattern centered close to 2.2 with roughly the same amount of spread. So you can use random variant in lots of ways. I don't know if I'll have time today, but for sure on Thursday, I'll show you another way to use random variant for simulation from, for user-defined distributions. You know, normal distributions, log normal distributions, exponential distributions, gamma distributions, chi-square distributions, those are all well-known distributions. But what if you're in a real-life situation where you've got to, uh, none of those distributions seems to be a good fit for your data? Maybe you've got to come up with an entirely new distribution on your own that seems to work better. Does that ever happen? I'm, I, maybe. I'd say most people use well-known distributions, but theoretically it could, it could come up. So I'll show you for sure on Thursday, maybe today, that you can come up with user-defined distributions. Let's move on to an application for the rest of the class today, an insurance application. You maybe have not dealt with insurance in your life, but your parents have for sure, and you will. Often insurance, whether it's car insurance, or say health insurance, especially, you have something called a deductible. Heard of that before? Deductible. Like a $20 deductible for a um, doctor visit. You got to pay out of pocket when you go into the doctor. And then the insurance company maybe covers the rest. Maybe they don't cover the rest 100%. Maybe they do. It'd be simplest if they do. Sometimes deductible, sometimes called the copay. Actually, copay and deductible, technically speaking, are, are different things in general. Um, copay is typically the pretty constant thing you do for each visit. And a deduct deductible typically might be sort of more like maximum payment you'd. Well, yeah. Maybe you have a deductible for the entire year based on any number of visits or something. That's sort of a maximum that you would pay out of pocket. Um, in the simplest situation, when you have a loss, so maybe we should imagine this more as like a car accident. If X is the loss random variable, representing say a monetary amount, of damage to your car, for example. Monetary damages. Could be damage to your car, could be damage to your house, could be damage to your health. It's however much you owe based on what happened. And let's say, let's just make it specific here. Let's say X is uniform on the interval from zero to a thousand, just to pick something specific. There's lots of different assumptions I could make about X <clears throat> based on the situation, different models for different situations. Maybe a better model would be an exponential model. maybe a normal model. Let's say it's uniform. 
So the PDF of X is zero when X is negative, zero when X is bigger than a thousand, and one over a thousand, which is 0 0.001 when X is between zero and a thousand. That would be little f sub x of little x. And again, it doesn't matter where you put the open and closed circles, but I'm not going to even gonna bother. There's a corresponding random variable. If you've got a deductible, call it y. That is going to be the amount the insurance company actually covers. If the deductible is a hundred, a hundred dollars, say, then why the payment random variable, how much the insurance company actually pays for your loss, is zero if. Your loss is less than 100. And is something positive when X is bigger than 100. If, for example, your loss is 700, you pay the first 100, the insurance company pays 600. 700 minus 100 is what they pay. X minus 100 if X is greater than or equal to 100. So. The payment variable, random variable, is a piecewise function of the loss random variable. To be consistent with our textbook notation, in chapter four, when they define things like expectations, general expectations, I'm thinking of page 105, this thing right here. I think I want to call this function, this piecewise function, how about capital H of X? Capital H of capital X, because capital X is random variable. Your insurance company based on the deductible being 100 and based on your loss distribution is interested in the distribution of Y. When I say X is greater than or equal to 100 here, I probably should have written it more as uh, X is between 100 and 1,000. Now you would think perhaps that this must mean <clears throat> Y also has a uniform distribution on the interval from zero to 900, so you would think that's not quite right. Why? Because there's a non-zero probability that Y equals zero. There's a positive probability that y equals zero. Y is not a continuous random variable. It's also not discrete. It's mixed. It's a mixed random variable. Partially discrete, partially continuous. Its PDF is difficult to describe. <clears throat> and in fact, I think I mostly want to just avoid describing its PDF. Its CDF is describable, but a little strange. What's its CDF? As always, the CDF is going to be the probability that the random variable is less than or equal to the given number. 
However, because of the nature of y being this piecewise function of x, I really should think of this CDF in a piecewise way as well, although truth be told, you always want to think of these things as piecewise, right? At least unless they're defined positively for all x, but let's, let's be extra thorough here. The CDF will equal zero if little y is strictly less than zero. It is going to equal one, leave some space, a lot of space in there. It is going to equal one if y is strictly greater than 900. What's a little confusing is what goes in between. If y equals zero, equals, this has a positive value. What is that positive value? Let me just do a little side calculation over here. F sub capital Y of zero. Oops. probability that y is less than or equal to zero turns out to equal the probability that y equals zero, which because of how y is related to x is the same as the probability that x is less than 100. Because y will be zero when x is less than 100, meaning when x is between zero and 100. It's the same as x being less than 100, which is not zero, but is said as 0.1. X is uniform. There's its PDF. 100 is right here. The probability that x is 100 is the area of that box. Base times height, 100 times 0 0.001 is 0 0.1, 110. This is a 0 0.1 if y equals 0. I actually could mix case two and case three here, but I wanted to emphasize the jump discontinuity at 0. The formula for case three, when y is strictly between zero and 900, I can include 900 in this, will be consistent with this equaling 0.1 when y is zero. In other words, whatever formula I put here will have a limiting value of 0.1 as y goes to zero from the right. But there's a jump discontinuity in the CDF at zero. What formula will go there? Um, that's another side calculation. If y is between 0 and 900, that's where I want to relate the formula. I want to relate capital Y to the formula in terms of capital X being x minus 100. So this is the same as the probability that x minus 100 is less than or equal to little y. Same as the probability that x is less than or equal to y plus 100. So I need the CDF of x, which I haven't written down yet, evaluated at y plus 100. What's the CDF of x? I haven't written its formula down. I have to integrate that function. The CDF of x, when x is between 0 and 1,000, integrate this, you're going to get 0.001x. That's the CDF of x. I need to use that down there. I need to replace x with y plus 100. So I get 0.001 times y plus 100. Or 0.001y plus um, 
point one. That's what goes up there. Point zero zero one y plus point one, which does have a limiting value of point one as y goes to zero. So yeah, I could have lapped case two and case three together, but I wanted to emphasize the jump discontinuity at zero. The graph of the CDF of y looks like this. It's zero, and y is negative. Open circle right there, for sure open circle. Close circle at point one when y equals zero, and then a line looking like this getting up to a value of one when y gets up to 900 and then is one thereafter. Not a perfect picture. That's capital F sub capital Y of little one. It's a discontinuous function at zero. What's its PDF then? Well, the PDF in general is the derivative of the CDF. So the slope of this is 0 0.001. So you would think that means then the graph of the CDF, of the PDF, excuse me, should be a horizontal line, right? Like that, with a value of 0 0.001 when y is between 0 and 900. But wait a minute. That wouldn't have an area under it equal to one. If it was the same graph as this, except only going up to nine to nine hundred instead of a thousand, its area would be 0.9, not one. How do I get around that difficulty? There's a way to get around it, but it's complicated. It involves something called the Dirac delta function, whose value is infinite, in this case at zero. There's like an infinite derivative at zero. What? Infinity is not a number. How do you do that? That's why we don't want to worry about it. Okay. <laughs> because it's just too hard for us. All right. This class is hard enough as it is. Delta function. Is not really a function in the usual sense. It's a, something called a distribution, which is not the same meaning as distribution and probability. But I, I don't want to get into that. That would be too far afield. It's better to just think about it with the CDF instead of thinking about it with PDF. But but wait a minute. What about the expected value of y, the mean? Wouldn't I have to deal with the PDF then? Because to find the mean, you got to integrate the variable time PDF, right? Yeah. Well, turns out we don't have to worry about the PDF still because of the general formula for expectation that I showed you 15 minutes ago. I'll show you again. General expectation formula, this one right here works no matter what h of x is as long as this is these conditions are hold this integral is finite and the the little f i can use is not the cdf of y but the cdf of x the loss random variable which is a nice pdf that doesn't have an infinite value anymore the original pdf for x that's what i can use so let's write that down now. The expected value of y y does equal a function of x, h of x. It's a piecewise function, but it's still a function. And that will be in the abstract, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the function h of little x times the PDF of x, f sub capital x of little x, 
But for our example, because F sub capital X is only positive when X is between zero and a thousand, I only need to integrate from zero to a thousand. I'm going to just write it as an H of X here still first. The F sub X is one over a thousand. That's, that's the point zero, zero one. But what is h of x again? h of x is this thing, which is zero up to 100 before it becomes x minus 100. So that means this integral from zero to 1,000 actually becomes an integral from 100 to 1,000. 100 to 1,000 of x minus 100 times the point zero zero one. And that's the integral to do. The x minus 100 comes from the piecewise formula right there. The fact that I can start the integral at 100 mean is because of the fact that h of x equals zero when x is less than 100. So the integral from zero to 100 is zero. Does that make sense? I mean, I could have written an integral from zero to 100, but it would have been zero. And you don't have to do this, but it might be a little easier conceptually if you don't do a substitution, u or w or whatever you want to be x minus 100, because then that'll be, you can change the limits of integration to be zero to 900. I didn't have to do that. In the end, you're going to get 0. 0.0005 times 900 squared for the mean. What should that be? Should that be 450? Halfway from 0 to 900? No. 405. What shouldn't it be 450? No, it should not be 450. Because Y does not have a uniform distribution on 0 to 900. Because it's mixed, it's got the non zero probability at 0. That's, that occurs with probability 0.1. It's sort of weighting the mean more towards 0 because of that. That's a kind of a that's kind of an unexpected result. What we've just discovered here for the mean of y is something that you wouldn't necessarily expect intuitively. X uniform zero to a thousand mean of five hundred. Why is this piecewise function of x subtracting off hundred? Intuitively, with, without being careful, you might think y is uniform on the interval from 0 to 900 and having a mean of 450. But no, because 0 occurs with positive probability, that causes the mean to be less than 450. It's not uniform on the interval from 0 to 900. I mean, if, the, if 0 occurred with a high, really high probability, 0 0.999, say, The mean would be really close to zero. Maybe one dollar or something. Okay, let's I think we can do this in five minutes. Let's try to simulate this to help us believe it. Let's see if we can do this in five minutes. I'm not sure if we can. Okay, well, perhaps the simplest way to do this is to not do what I was thinking of that I'll show you on Thursday is to do a user defined distribution, but instead, so this is going to be X data again, but now X data is going to come from a uniform distribution on zero to a thousand. I don't know if this is the syntax here. 
Okay, it looks like it worked. So there's 100 X values that are uniformly distributed between zero and a thousand. If you made a histogram, the X data should be fairly uniform, yeah. What's its mean? It should be close to 500. One, that does get closer to 500. <laughs> You're gonna do it until it's clearly close to 500. There we go. If I do a piecewise function in Mathematica like this, Can I apply that function to the X data? I think I can just do this. Nope, that didn't work. Oh, well, sort of works. Mm, but not so nicely, let's see here. Uh, No, nope, not apply. Uh, what is the command? Uh, map. I think that's it. Map. Yeah, that works. Okay. Map. Oh, I forgot. I already forgot the syntax, though. Map. Okay, there we go. See it. Map H X data. There is the corresponding payments from the insurance company. Notice there are some zeros, exactly zeros. What's the mean of the Y data? It should be closer to 405 than 450. Simulation, good for complicated situations like on Thursday when we will look at truths and ladders. And also for just like, I don't feel so sure about the theory. Maybe I should do a simulation and see if the theory gets confirmed. Good thing. All right, have a good day.